All right, so hello and welcome again. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Ark of Lehigh, Northampton Counties. If you hear wailing in the background, that is my three-month-old son, so I do apologize for that. Um, so welcome to Goal Writing and Progress Monitoring for Students with IEPs. Today is Wednesday, October 19, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. We welcome Mrs. Tanya Alvarado uh, to present this uh, webinar for us this evening. Quick disclaimer for the Arc of Lehigh Northampton counties. Our advocacy department does not employ nor provide uh, employ lawyers nor provide legal advice. This training or any other provided by the Arc's advocacy department does not constitute or imply the endorsement recommendation or favoring of the providing party or any employees or contractors acting on its behalf. This webinar is being provided for educational and informative purposes only. So welcome, Tanya. All right, um, I'm going to launch right into this because there's a lot of information and it's a lot of technical information when you're talking about goal writing and progress monitoring. A little progress every day adds up to big results. And I, I like this quote because it really kind of hones in on the importance of progress monitoring frequent, frequently. Um, you know, you're not going to see a lot of progress from one day to the next. And sometimes the progress looks like they've made progress one day and then didn't make progress the next day. But, you know, we're looking for trends, um, but a little bit every day will add up to big results by the end of the year. And, and you know, that's, that's the purpose of the IDEA and the IEP. Um, there are some portions of the IDEA that relates to progress monitoring information provided to the family and, you know, how much a parent um, is involved in the creation of the IEP. Some of the areas, I'm just going to touch upon some areas of the um, IDEA at first, because I really want to focus on the actual progress monitoring, the goals, and what to look for, what to look out for as we go through the presentation. But um, some provisions of the IDEA are very clear that the parent must be fully informed of all information relevant to an activity. This this relates to the development of the IEP. Um, parents are entitled to all information that, that's relevant to the um, development of the IEP and also the progress of your child and the education that's being delivered. And that the parent understands and agrees in writing to the carrying out of the activity. So again, um, we're going to emphasize a little bit later during the presentation how important it is to just ask questions, make sure you understand what the professionals around the table are talking about. Sometimes it's very difficult as a parent to sit at a table with a lot of um, professionals in the field who are used to using acronyms and, and terms of art that are very customary in the field, but not so familiar to a parent who doesn't do um, special education every day. Um, the parent is a participant at the IEP meeting and the public agency must take whatever action is necessary to ensure that the parent understands the proceedings. Again, this is going to be um, something that we're going to revisit throughout the presentation, but it really is an emphasis to the parents um, who are joining us and um, just everyone on, on uh, the webinar tonight that um, it's important to, to be able to explain to the parent what's being evaluated, what the terms mean, and, and what the goal is for the end of the IEP year. These are um, different aspects of the IEP and what's required to be part of the IEP. Um, what we're going to focus on are the statement of measurable annual goals. Um, the um, IDEA requires that measurable annual goals be identified within the IEP document. Um, you know, the previous slide had the present educational levels. We'll break all of that down in, in a minute. Um, with respect to short-term objectives, they're not required anymore. Um, the um, amendments to the IDEA took them out, except for students who qualify to take alternative assessments like the PASA, the P-A-S-A. Um, if your child is taking a, a PASA test, then um, 
their IEP should absolutely have the short-term objectives. These are typically children who are identified um, as having an intellectual disability. Um, um, sometimes they're uh, autistic spectrum, but you know, on, on you know, one end of the continuum, but um, that's when it's required. The fact that it's required for some students doesn't mean that it can't be in your child's IEP if you don't um, qualify for the PASA. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, there are some instances where it's a good idea to have the short-term objectives. Um, the IEP must also include a description of how the child's progress towards meeting the annual goals will be measured and when the periodic reports will be provided to the parent. Um, typically, we see these uh, periodic reports that are called progress monitoring reports are provided at the time where the students receive the report cards, um, at the very least when the students receive the report cards and the entire school does. Um, but you can also ask for these reports of progress more frequently, and it makes sense in certain circumstances where you do wanna monitor the progress more frequently than um, when the report cards are delivered. The IDEA has an entire section only on parent participation. And um, the reason I wanted to focus on that is, again, um, there's a great emphasis in the statute that the parent understand what the child's programming is, the evaluation results, and ultimately what they're agreeing to when they sign the NORAP indicating whether they agree or disagree with the IEP. Um, again, I wanna emphasize it because especially when we get into progress monitoring, a lot of terminology is used that parents are not familiar with. Um, reports of progress based on the um, program that's being used with acronyms and, and you know, uh, abbreviations that the parents may not be aware of. So again, I do wanna emphasize that if you have questions, please ask it is important that the parent understand what their child's needs are and how they'll be addressed in the IEP. Okay, what is progress monitoring? It's a scientifically based practice used to assess academic progress and evaluate the effectiveness of the instruction. Fundamentally, it answers the question, is my child learning and making the progress that is expected um, in the IEP? Fundamentally, that's the purpose of what progress monitoring is. It's, um, I like to say it's, it's like a roadmap. The IEP provides a roadmap in terms of the identifying present educational levels as your starting point, identifying the annual goals, and um, identifying when the student is, go is going to or should be expected to reach certain goals. Um, so, you know, if you've ever taken a road trip, and I know many of us have, and I don't know how many people are still using those paper maps. I love paper maps. I, you know, um, but, you know, if you're setting out your trip, you can anticipate, you know, you know how long it's going to take to get from one point to the other point. You know where you should be maybe halfway through your trip. That's the same um, concept applies to progress monitoring and setting these annual goals. They are annual goals, but you don't have to wait to the end of the school year to see whether you've gotten there. Um, you do have the reporting periods um, in between, but um, like I said, the frequency could be more. Um, you can ask questions and really try to determine whether the rate of your child's progress throughout the year will result in their meeting their goal at the end of the year. Okay, the progress monitoring process has several steps. It starts with a comprehensive evaluation because you have to identify your starting point where are we starting on this road trip? And that's essentially what the evaluation answers. The comprehensive evaluation um, will do a variety of assessments, um, but will identify the um, present educational levels of your child. Those levels are going to be identified in the IEP. After, after we know those levels are a starting point, you design appropriate annual goals and short-term objectives if your child qualifies for that. Um, and so you know where you're expected to go during the course of the year. Then the district uses the instructional, instructional measures and then they start measuring progress. So you could see 
how are we doing on this annual road trip? Um, and how far are we, you know, at different parts of the year towards meeting the, the goal? Okay, the evaluation, it can be an um, evaluation report, the initial evaluation, a re-evaluation report, or even an IEE that provides information about your child's needs. It is so important to identify your child's needs, strengths and weaknesses, um, because that's, that's what you're gonna identify as the annual goal. So that gives you some guidance in terms of where the weaknesses are and what strengths can you draw upon for your child's strengths to help them you know, uh, go through the learning process. Um, the um, evaluation um, or setting your child or identifying your child's starting point is also um, can be based on curriculum based assessments, um, reading inventories. It really should be an accumulation of a lot of different information, a lot of pieces of information that all feed into the question of where is the child's um, educational breakdown occurring so that they can identify the right instructional program to provide your child. And then you can start um, measuring the progress throughout the year. But the evaluation is the first step. Um, I've listed on here different um, things that um, the district can rely on um, for the evaluation process. Um, but fundamentally, the evaluation should identify where the child's breakdown is and how that impacts learning in the classroom. Okay, the present levels of educational performance. These um, should be very specific in terms of what your child can and cannot do. So we're looking for brief, clear, specific, and accurate statements. So it's not enough to say that, you know, Susie is behind in reading or struggling with reading. Um, it should be more specific in terms of, you know, what reading level are they reading in? What areas of the reading process is, is occurring in terms of a, a breakdown? There are five areas of the reading process. There is um, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, uh, fluency, vocabulary, and reading comprehension. Um, all of these processes, um, that some of them are elemental processes for the beginning of the decoding process, but they all work together. It's like riding a bike. You can get all the different pieces of the skill together to um, accomplish reading comprehension. And if there's a breakdown in any one of those areas, then your child is going to struggle um, with reading. So it's not enough to say that your child is struggling with reading in terms of the present um, levels of, of performance, but to identify what aspect of the reading process is affecting your child. And um, so we can identify the interventions for your student. Um, okay, and the present levels of educational performance should be um, informed by the evaluations. So from our first step. The present levels of educational performance should not group skills together. So like I said before, you know, Susie's struggling with reading. That's grouping all five areas of the reading process together. It doesn't really explain what, which areas, um, you know, Susie may be struggling in. So if you're going to identify um, an area of a weakness or um, in reading, um, that should be broken down and specifically identified where, what part of the reading process is the breakdown occurring? And what does the breakdown look like? You know, so for instance, if it's a reading fluency need, then, um, you know, the, the um, present educational level should identify how many words correct per minute the student is reading and, and where uh, a typical child would be in that, that same time period. So, you know, if you're looking at um, the middle of first grade, and your child has a certain score in the reading fluency, compare that to what is the expected score for a child in the middle of the first grade. So you can see where the breakdown is and how, how large a breakdown it is and just kind of, and, and you know what your goal is. Um, so um, in terms of reporting a skill as an overall score, 
um, you do, again, you want to break it down. You don't want to say, well, you know, they're doing math at a second grade level. Um, there's a, a lot of information that's missing there. Is it a math fluency issue? Is it difficulty with multiplication or division? Or is it um, uh, addition and subtraction? Um, you know, are the math difficulties more with comprehension or abstract concepts like, like time and, and coins? Or is it the computation? Um, so remember for present educational levels, you want to be as specific as possible because that's where we're going to go into to identify the annual goals. Um, also look out for performance that's assessed through um, group work. So, you know, if your child is um, working in a group and the entire group gets a certain grade, um, you do want to ask more questions about, well, how involved or how much did my child participate in this group and whether there's any work that was individually done before, you know, the results of the group were, were all put together. Um, if there's any um, present levels of educational performance that includes subjective measures. Um, so, you know, the teacher assesses whether the child has performed the skill rather than using an assessment measure that has been created and is objective um, to test your child. You really want the testing to occur through objective measures rather than, than subjective measures. Okay. The goals um, and objectives in an IEP. Um, the annual goals are the big picture. They're the, you know, where are we starting in the beginning of the IEP year? And we're going to identify where we want to end up. It's, you know, as I said before, if you're planning a road trip, we're identifying where you're starting and where you're heading. Um, you know, like Philadelphia to Chicago, let's say. Um, with the short-term objectives are also called benchmarks sometimes, and they're the ones where you're going to stop off along the way. You know, if it's, if it's a 10 hour trip, where do we expect to be after five hours? And then, um, you look at the progress monitoring information and everything to see where, where the student is maybe halfway through the year, or, you know, at the time you get the report card, um, and um, the short-term objectives, if, you're tr if there are short-term objectives identified in the IEP, those should be identified with the same level of specificity as the annual goal, so that um, they look like little mini goals with different timeframes. But you could see how, you know, over the course of the year with the different short-term objectives, um, typically there are about four of them, you could see um, the progress if they're identified in the short-term objectives of how um, the IEP team is planning for to get to the student to the end of the road trip there by the end of the year. So what are the important elements of an annual goal? Um, they, um, in terms of a um, skill area, for instance, you don't want it just to say reading, but you want to identify what area in the reading process is creating um, a difficulty. You do want to identify the specific weakness being addressed. So, you know, if it's decoding, is it, you know, consonant, vowel, consonant? And um, I listed here CVC. That is a term that's used, I see a, lo a lot in IEPs. Um, if you don't understand what that term means, you know, as a parent, please ask. Um, just make sure you understand what everyone else is talking about when they're developing the program. Um, words correct per minute, that relates to a fluency goal and how quickly the child can read words um, in text. Um, if you're talking about a weakness in reading comprehension, you want to break that down also. Is it, is it a weakness with inferential? or explicit questions. So for instance, you know, the inferential questions would be something like why, why did something happen? Something that you have to infer that's not written into the text. Explicit questions are written into the text. You know, what color was the man's jacket? Um, what season was it? 
um, you know, what was the name of the man's dog? Um, that information is written explicitly in the text. And the reason you want to know and understand these differences is because the, um, if your child has needs with reading comprehension, but does really well with explicit questions and cannot engage in the inferential abstract reasoning process, you wanna make sure that annual goal is directed towards the inferential questions and in reading comprehension rather than the explicit questions because it may look like your child is making progress or mastering a goal, but if they're if part of their goal is to answer explicit questions, they're not really addressing their area of weakness or their area of need. Um, a good annual goal also identifies the baseline where we're starting from. Um, the expected level of achievement, that's kind of where are we ending up and how, um, what is the rate of accuracy or the rate of mastery that we're looking for. Um, it also identifies how progress will be measured and how frequently progress will be measured. And all of these are identified in the IEP. I have here um, a copy of the IEP provided by Patan on their website, but here we have um, the table that we normally see with these annual goals. And we see that the measurable annual goal um, is there on the left. How the progress will be measured um, is the next column, when, and then the report on progress is the last column there. Um, right now, we're going to focus on the measurable annual goal. Um, we see underneath that the short-term objectives and the benchmarks, and we're gonna talk about those now for a bit. All right, what is a good IEP goal? Um, I like to call it, you know, let's get SMART with these IEP goals. Um, SMART is an acronym. It stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time Limited. It has all the aspects of what's required under the IDEA. The goal should be specific, clearly, and specifically stated so that anyone picking up that IEP will understand what your child is working on. So we're looking to stay away from words like, um, you know, um, Sammy will achieve a Lexile score of 500 in this program, this reading program. What does that mean? You know, what, what is a student working on? Um, so, so, you want anyone picking up that IEP to be able to say, oh, Sammy has difficulty with reading fluency. Sammy is, you know, reading at a first grade level at, at this speed, and we want the student to, to read at this level, grade level, at a higher speed. You know, um, so identifying um, to scores or um, scores from a program really isn't sufficiently informative to let, let someone know what specifically the child is working on. Um, it has to be measurable, as I said before. We know the starting point, we know the end point, um, and it has to be objectively measured. Um, it also has to be achievable. Is the goal realistic? Are we setting a realistic goal for the student to get from point A to point B um, by the end of the school year? And um, a lot of that plays into what your child's abilities are, and also, um, you know, uh, the supports that are provided to help your child um, be successful in these goals. Um, the relevant part um, doesn't match the needs identified in the child's evaluation. And we see many times, and I have a couple of examples in the slides, where a child has a difficulty with math computation, but the annual goal talks about geometry or trigonometry or, you know, algebra, um, you know, it doesn't, it's, is that relevant to the child's needs with math computation um, or their difficulty with math fluency being able to compute rapidly? Um, so, you know, those are some of the things we want to look at. The time limited, um, these are pretty um, specific and pretty easy. It's implied in every IEP that the it's, it's an annual IEP. You want the child to reach those goals by the end of the year. Um, but we're going to talk about, um, you know, short-term objectives would identify shorter timeframes and how those might come into play. 
Okay. Um, it's a little bit more information about, you know, what are we looking for for specific goals? It has to identify the skill area. Um, and you should have a separate goal for every skill. So if the student is delayed in reading, decoding, and reading fluency, you don't want to see them in the same goal because when that skill is measured, we don't know what's being measured, you know, or you're running the risk of, of that not being reported. So if there are two areas or, or more in the reading process where your child is affected, you want to break that down. So you want one goal for reading, decoding, a different goal for reading fluency. If your child has a reading comprehension needs, you want to see the broken down in the reading comprehension goal. Is it with explicit questions or inferential questions? Because you want to make sure that when the child is getting um, the delivery of the instructional program and they're reporting on the progress, that they're actually addressing and measuring your child's progress in their area of weakness. And as I said before, it should be an understandable language. Okay, the baseline. Every goal must have a baseline. We need to know where we're starting. Um, you get these from the present educational levels. Um, as I said before, it could be obtained for the evaluation reports. It could be obtained from curriculum-based measures, research-based programming. Um, there are many different um, areas where you can obtain this um, information. Um, some of it for behavioral goals could be obtained from classroom observations or a functional behavioral assessment. So um, you must, must have a baseline identified in the annual goal. In that section of the IEP that we all just looked at, the baseline has to be identified so that you know where the child has started. The expected levels of achievement, basically, where do you want to end up? by the end of the school year. Um, the, the assessment of whether your child is getting there should be objectively measured. And um, given your child's starting point and their rate of progress, you can see whether it can be achieved within the, the calendar year. As the year goes along, you'll be able through the progress monitoring, determine whether you're making enough progress towards the goal so that you can achieve it by the end of the year or whether your child's making too much progress and is going to achieve that goal before the end of the year. So the progress monitoring does um, come into play as um, an area of importance. All right, expected levels of achievement. Um, I get this question a lot in terms of what is a good expected level of achievement? Um, it has to be at mastery. So, you know, whether the question of, you know, is 80% mastery, 85, 90, or 100%, what should be identified as the percentage that of, of accuracy that we want our child to be able to demonstrate the skill? And my answer to you is it really, it depends on the skill and the need. 100% accuracy um, makes sense sometimes. If your child is learning the letters of the alphabet, why would we be okay with the child only knowing 80% of the alphabet? Um, I didn't do the calculation, so I don't know how many letters um, they wouldn't know <laughs> if they didn't know all the letters of the alphabet. But I think it's a reasonable expectation to say, you know, if your child is learning the letters of the alphabet, um, you should want that at 100%, you know. Um, managing frustration appropriately is 85% a good um, expected level of achievement or do, do we want it to be higher? Um, those are conversations that would occur during the IEP team meeting, but it's also something that I want um, parents to also think about, you know, if your child is able to comprehend what they read 80% of the time, is that really enough? Or is 85% of the time really enough? How much knowledge are they gaining from what they're reading? if they don't understand 20% of it, um, you know, so, so keep those levels in mind. Um, you know, there is, um, you know, um, I like to go honestly, no less than 85 on, on, you know, determining whether the child has met mastery. Um, you really don't want to go under 80%. That's, that does not demonstrate mastery. 
means your child, you know, maybe three quarters of the time is achieving a skill. And that's not something that's considered mastery. In terms of the relevance, um, again, it must address your child's needs that were identified in the evaluation. Um, and it should not be set to a computerized measure. And, and what I mean by that um, is, you know, as I stated before, you don't want the, um, at the goal to be that your child is gonna read however many lexiles. I mean, you know, does anyone really, as I'm saying it, truly understand what that means or what areas of reading are being addressed? The evaluations that are conducted are not conducted on lexiles. Lexiles are gathered from, there's one curriculum-based measure that can be used. It's a program that um, can be used to gather that information, but it doesn't tell us whether the child is having difficulty with decoding or what sounds that the child has um, difficulty with. Is it a you know, consonant, vowel consonant, or is it you know, shorter a vowel consonant you know, type wording that they're having difficulty with? It says nothing about fluency. Um, how much is your child understanding in terms of reading comprehension? What kind of questions are they having difficulty with or struggling with? You know, um, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered in terms of, of what your child's needs are and where that breakdown is occurring. So you don't want the, the either the baseline or the annual goal to be identified by a certain number that you can derive through a computer program and say, well, you know, if they can achieve it, this skill at, you know, 620, then we're okay with that. Um, you know, I mean, what does that mean? Um, you should have a goal for each skill, even if, um, you know, it's in a general area. So um, you don't want it kind of grouped together, as I said before, each, each, goal, each skill should have a separate goal. Um, you do not want your goals set to achieving a score on the PSSAs or even proficiency on the PSSAs. Um, the purpose of an IEP is not to ensure that your child is performing skills that will enable them to pass, you know, um, I guess for the purpose of passing state assessments. What, what the IEP and the evaluations from the evaluations report reports, what they really assess is in, in your child's area of need, what are the skills that are necessary and where is the breakdown occurring? You know, you don't see um, PSSA as an evaluation to try to determine what your child's needs are in math, for instance, in, in an evaluation report. Um, we do see them in evaluation reports as an indicator of what, you know, how your child did on the test, you know, did they score in the advanced, proficient, basic, or below basic range. But in terms of identifying why your child obtained the score that they did, that's what the other assessments are about. And, and those assessments test math computation, math fluency, um, math problem solving, kind of that abstract um, inf uh, analysis, you know, in math. Um, so, so you don't want to see the annual goal referencing something like a PSSA or, you know, passing their geometry class. Um, you know, it really needs to identify the skill that was found to be a deficit in the evaluations. Um, time bound, as I said before, um, this is not difficult, you know, to achieve um, in the IEP. Typically, um, it's, it's a year-long IEP, so, so it's a year. If there are other timeframes, though, within the year that you would identify, by this time period, we want them to have achieved this much. Um, that's where the short-term objectives come in. As I said before, if your child is taking the alternate assessments like the PASAs or you know, those types of tests, then the short-term objectives are required to be in the IEP and they break down the annual goal into even shorter terms. They identify the specific timeframes by which each portion of that skill will be achieved. It enables the parents and the district to really look at the child's progress throughout the, the year, really check in to see, you know, get, get a better eye and a, you know, a more keen sense of how the child's progress is going. 
and whether it needs to be revisited. Um, that's not different from any other child's IEP. Um, honestly, that's the process that should be occurring for every child that has an IEP. Every child that has an IEP has an annual goal and you want to ensure that they're making progress throughout the school year towards that annual goal. And um, you know, if it's not explicitly broken down in the IEP, you could still break it down also as your as a parent and say, well, you know, by this time frame, then they should be here um, the way we do when we, we plan our road trips. Um, there's some other um, skills that um, were, would be beneficial to have short-term objectives. Um, behavior, behavior plans sometimes um, are a good area where you may want to um, identify short-term objectives, particularly if your child is having a lot of difficulty dealing with frustration, they have a lot of avoidance issues. Um, you know, if you're building skills towards achieving an annual goal, you want to check in more frequently, um, maybe identify some short-term objectives in terms of when the child is going to achieve certain skills, you know, um, um, or portions of the skills in a shorter time frame. So you know that you're on track and you can have a better idea of whether you're really um, on the road um, to achieving that goal. Okay, so we're getting to the fun part. Um, I have a sample here for everyone. Um, and now that you know everything about progress monitoring and identifying annual goals, and we know about, you know, SMART goals, we're going to take a look at um, present educational levels. This is a real life um, comparison here. <laughs> um, and um, anyway, okay, so we have a fifth grade student and their reevaluation report, we know that they have um, difficulty with two digit division problems, which they can answer at 30% accuracy two digit multiplication pro, pro, um, difficulties. Um, and the percentage there is covered by my, um, by the Zoom <laughs> panel, but, um, and they multiply fractions with uncommon denominators at 60% accuracy. So, so these are the areas that we would identify as, okay, these are, this is what we need to work on in terms of annual goals. Um, the present educational levels, I have here a benchmark math assessment using the STAR math assessment. And you can see here, you know, these statistics that I was talking about before. Um, in September 2019, the student scored a 590 at grade level 3.0. What does that mean? You know, what does a 590 comprise? Um, what was the highest score? I mean, what score are we expecting for, you know, the student um, back in 2019, um, you know, about a year before this present educational level um, was written? Um, we know it's a third grade level and the student now is at a fifth grade level. So I guess it was a, a year behind, but we don't know specifically what skills were breaking down or, you know, why the score was at that level. Um, and then we have the other two scores and we see that it went up and then we went back down um, in December of 2020 to 620, which at that point was a 2.3 grade level, but we still don't know where the breakdown occurred, what skills were being tested and why this is all happening. So, um, so is this a good present educational level? Um, we would say, no, it is not. The, um, it's not specifically descriptive of the student's needs and it doesn't really relate back to the needs that were identified in the reevaluation report. Some of the more specific areas that, um, you know, where we can point out, you know, where, where is the language here in terms of specificity, um, the S and the SMART goal, is that we see that um, the assessment program tests a range of the student's knowledge in basic math, geometry, algebra, and um, statistics. So, you know, we don't want a program that's testing a range of knowledge because that's, it's, it's combining a lot of different skills. There are some skills here where the student may have a lot of strengths and some other areas where they have 
a lot of weaknesses. Um, so that's one of the problems here with this goal. Um, basic math, algebra, geometry, and statistics. Um, as I said before, it's too much of a combination. Um, if we look at the scores, like I said before, they're not informative. We don't know um, where the areas of breakdown are occurring. Okay. Slide two on the present educational levels. We have the same student, same areas of need um, that were identified in the reevaluation report. And remember, when you're identifying present educational levels, you want to go back to the evaluation report or back to you know the the um, curriculum-based measures, um, the um, reading inventories and math inventories the types of assessments that were conducted in order to see you know, where the child is performing. Okay, so the present educational level for this slide says, this student can subtract two and three digit numbers with 90% accuracy. Um, he completed two digit division problems with 30% accuracy and two digit multiplication with 40% accuracy. Um, so in this instance, we have a student who is just evaluated in their reevaluation, and the information for the present educational levels are being taken directly from their reevaluation report, which which is appropriate. Um, if the student was just evaluated, you know we know exactly where, where they are and where they're performing, um, and these um, levels are identified. And we have appropriate description of present educational levels. Any person can pick up this document and say, I know this student has difficulty with two and three digit um, numbers, you know, um, I'm sorry, they, they have no difficulty <laughs> adding and subtracting two to three digit numbers, but they do have difficulty when it comes to division, two digit multiplication, fractions with uncommon denominators, you know, you know exactly where the student is struggling and, and the kind of intervention that they need. Okay, so now we're going to look, um, apply the same skills and we're going to look at a measurable annual goal. And in this instance, um, we have the same student, um, but now we're writing a goal for the student um, based on their needs. So this goal says, um, given a monthly research-based assessment in math, Sam, these names are made up by the way, um, Sam will increase his overall score by at least 100 points over the IEP term to increase his knowledge of algebraic concepts, geometry, probability, overall basic math skills by the end of the IEP term. Um, the baseline with STAR assessment was 620, which equates to 4.3 grade level. And um, okay, so what do we think about this measurable annual goal? Does it pass the test? No, um, it does not pass the test, it's not an appropriate annual goal. Remember, we have our SMART test. Is it specific, measurable, achievable, um, relevant, and um, time, time limited? Okay, so let's, um, let's take a closer look at this annual goal. Given a monthly research-based assessment in math, and, and I don't have a, um, I don't think this is a bad thing overall. Um, the only reason I've underlined it is because I wanted to raise that. Um, you wanna make sure that the assessment that's being used is an assessment that's testing the child in their area of need. Um, it should be peer reviewed, scientifically developed research-based assessment. Um, there's some research-based assessments that are not uh, peer reviewed. Um, so, you know, so you want to ask some questions, you know, what are you using to, to test the child to determine whether um, they've made progress? Okay, let's look at some other aspects of this annual goal. Um, increase the overall scaled score. Um, you know, 
again, what does it mean and what are we working on and, and how much, you know, how much um, do we want to increase? Um, and it says by at least 100 points. So how do we know whether the child has made progress? You know, what if they increase it by 200 points? What, is, what does that mean? Was the goal set too low? Um, what are we measuring? You know, are, are we addressing the two digit division problems and the multiplication problems and fractions um, and things like that? So um, it's difficult to discern from this um, annual goal what the child is expected to achieve. We know at minimum 100 points, um, but is that what type of expected level of achievement is, is it? You know, are we even at 80%? I mean, what are we comparing it to? Um, okay, increase his knowledge is another, it's a very vague term. You know, if you increase it by one point, that's technically an increase. You know, is, is, has the child mastered the goal? Um, if they're increasing their knowledge. Um, and then the other aspects, which I'm sure you've already, you know, figured out yourself, we're looking at increasing knowledge of algebraic concepts, geometry, probability, you know, um, these are all very vague terms, you know, increasing his knowledge of geometry and what are they working on? specifically, and how does that relate to the child's needs as identified in the evaluation? Same with probability, algebraic concepts. I mean, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> um, you know, so, so you have to be careful when you see um, annual goals that are um, written this way, because if you can't pick it up and know exactly what your child is working on, then it's not specific enough. Um, and you know the overall basic math skills again. Um, that's that's an issue. By the end of the IEP term, um, may or may not be problematic. You know sometimes you have revisions of IEPs. Um, you know you have to be clear at an IEP meeting if you're revising the IEP and you're adding a new goal. When do you expect that goal to be achieved? And that's something where, you know, you have to have a discussion with the IEP team about what the expectations are and what goals you're setting. Okay. Um, this baseline was, you know, obtained through a computerized measure. And I'm not saying that all computerized measures are bad. You know, they're not. Some of them are very, very good, but you have to ask questions when you see just any, any um, measure that's being used to determine the child's um, baseline. Um, and we have the same measure here. It's, it's a score of 620. You know, we don't know what that means or how far they are from um, improving on the skills that were identified in the reevaluation report. Okay, we're going to look at another IEP goal. Um, and um, I'm sorry, before we go there, um, these are the more specific uh, difficulties regarding the, um, the goal. Um, and I've set them out here so that everyone can take them home and take a look at it. Um, you know, look out for words like increase, um, overall basic math skills. That's a very vague term and you wanna stay away from vague terms. Um, yeah, what skills are you measuring, you know, in terms of, you know, star measures, what does 620 mean? And how does that relate um, to the evaluation? Um, as I said before, the, you know, overall scale score by at least 100 points of more. I mean, what, what level of mastery are we talking about? Is it 85, 90%? Are we talking about 60% mastery? You know, so those are the types of questions you wanna ask during an IEP meeting of, you know, what we're looking at and, and you know, what percentage are we asking the student to uh, reach consistently? Because that's when we know the child has mastered a skill. If the, you know, rate of mastery is set at 50%, that's like flipping a coin. You know, sometimes they'll get it right, sometimes they won't. Um, but you want, you want the child's skills to be at a much stronger and consistent level. Um, okay. So we're going to look at this measurable annual goal. Um, given an unfamiliar passage at a fifth grade level, the student will independently read 
195 words correct per minute with 95% accuracy on three consecutive biweekly trials. And then we have the baseline. Um, sorry, it's blocked there a bit. Um, okay. And the baseline is um, 94 words correct per minute with an accuracy of 99%. So this student's baseline at the fifth grade level, um, the accuracy is at 99%, and that's really wonderful. But their, um, their words per minute, their fluency is at 94, which is in the 10th percentile for fifth grade. Um, I have made all these numbers up, um, but, but I do think that's accurate, though. I did look it up um, on a chart. Um, 94 words correct per minute for a fifth grade student in January, about halfway through the school year, is at a 10th percentile. It's, it's at the lower end. Um, so the um, purpose of this goal is for the student to read at a fifth grade level, but at 195 words correct per minute. That's at the 90th percentile with a 95% accuracy. So um, it's an ambitious goal. It's, you know, it's absolutely at 95% accuracy looking for mastery in terms of performance. But um, let's take a look at, you know, whether this is an appropriate measurable annual goal. The survey says, yes, um, we have um, a descriptive um, annual goal of the child specific needs. And we're gonna look at this a little more closely. Um, given an unfamiliar passage, and one of the things I loved about this annual goal is that it identifies that when the child is tested for reading fluency, they're going to be given text that they've never seen before. This is a true test of this child's ability to read a passage. Um, and it's an area that you want to discuss during the IEP team because during the meeting, the IEP team meeting, because um, you wanna make sure when the um, progress towards, um, you know, mastery with progress monitoring is being conducted that they're not shown the same passage that they've been working on, um, you know, while they were practicing and because they would be familiar with it. So you don't really know you know, if you're giving them the same passage that they've seen before, are you truly testing their ability to, to read it at a certain rate or are you testing their memory um, and their ability to remember what they had read before? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I like about the fact that it, it asked for unfamiliar passage. Um, we have identified on the fifth grade level, we know specifically what grade level this child is supposed to be reading at you know, by the end of the, the year. Independently read the words. Um, that's another important aspect of this measurable annual goal because you do wanna know whether the child has been assisted in terms of, you know, the reading fluency. Um, you know, are, are they choral reading or is someone helping them read it? Um, you wanna know that, that the child is reading the passage when they're being, tested to see whether they're making progress, um, that they're reading it independently. Now, to, while they're being instructed in reading fluency, it's okay, you know, it's actually um, uh, recommended that they, they have choral reading, that, you know, they read one section, somebody else has read some, you know, another sentence, um, that they listen to someone reading fluency, that way they can see and, and hear what it, what it looks like. Um, so, you know, absolutely, if, if it's during instruction, it's totally fine. But when you're trying to measure the child's progress of being able to read fluently on their own, which is the goal, you want to make sure that that progress monitoring is being done as an independent reader with no help. Um, 195 words correct per minute with 95% accuracy. I mean, that's very specific. We know exactly where we want this child to be at the end of the IEP year. I also want to point out the words correct per minute in the annual goal, which is very important. Um, sometimes I see annual goals where it says 195 words per minute, but 
We don't know whether the child has read the, the word correctly. Um, sometimes students read partial words. Um, so, so you wanna make sure that the word correct is in there because if the child is reading 195 words correctly per minute, then all of the words they read count when you're trying to assess whether they, they're meet, meeting their goal. 95% um, accuracy, definitely within the mastery range. And the frequency, three consecutive biweekly trials. This is a great frequency. Um, the, you know, the teacher who's providing the instruction, um, you know, is going to test the student biweekly. Um, and when they're doing the testing, then the student has to do it three times in a row, three times in a row biweekly. Um, that's what they're looking for in terms of mastery. So the student isn't just kind of doing it once um, and then, you know, and then everyone's saying that they mastered the skill. So um, this is a well-written goal. Um, I, I, there are so many aspects of it that I really like. Um, it's ambitious. It um, identifies the student has to do it independently. The passage has to be unfamiliar. So you know you're getting a real clean testing of, of the student's skill. Okay, um, and as before, I've written down everything I love about this goal. Um, and, um, you know, this is on the slide there for everyone to be able to refer back to, you know, if you have any questions or if you see any um, goals that, you know, may be familiar in your own child's IEP in terms of the level of specificity, um, measurability, um, you know, those SMART goals, um, that standard that we're looking for. Um, there's some good examples here. Okay, I do have a um, under measurable beware in progress in the progress reporting for this goal that when the progress is reported, um, the goal is measuring accuracy and words per minute. So you want to see in the progress reporting two things. You want to see how accurate it was and how many words per minute. So just, um, you know, it doesn't make the goal inappropriate, but when the progress monitoring is provided, you wanna see both of those elements in there. Okay. And whether um, the goal is achievable, as I said before, um, relates to your child's abilities, their strengths as they were identified in the um, evaluations, but also um, look at past levels of progress in terms of their performance. Um, and you'll know whether something is too ambitious or sufficiently ambitious, or whether um, or whether it's not you know, um, ambitious enough. Um, sometimes if your child has not made um, expected progress in the past, it could be that an area of need was not identified or, you know, the programming that they received didn't uh, specifically address their, their needs. So if your child made slow progress previously or, you know, not much progress, um, then it's not very useful to kind of look back and say, oh, well, they didn't make, you know, that much progress before then, you know, we, we shouldn't expect very much in the future. You do want the goals to be ambitious. Um, you want them to be achievable. Um, but you do want to look towards, you know, moving your child ahead. Okay. So these are some um, examples of, um, and I'm sorry, I can't read my slide because there's stuff on top of it. Um, Short-term objectives um, that we talked about before. Um, so I wanted to put an example here with respect to, you know, what should short-term objectives look like? And like the annual goal that we had um, identified before, um, the short-term objectives have the same standards. They have to be um, related to SMART goals. So, you know, these are time bound by December 31st. We know that we want Ray to name 20 new objects in his environment. Um, with 100% um, accuracy um, by March 15th, um, an additional 20 new objects. So, you know, now he should be at about 40. 
And by June 15th, you want another 20 additional objects that will get them to the um, reaching the annual goal of 60. Um, I set the goal here to 100% accuracy. Um, it doesn't have to be 100%, but it, it largely relates to what you want him to identify and name. Um, like I said before, sometimes 100% accuracy is not necessary. You don't need that that you know level to, to reach mastery, but sometimes it really is necessary. Like knowing the letters of the alphabet, you know, um, why shouldn't a child be able to identify every letter of the alphabet? Um, you know, it's something that they they will be seeing every time they read. You know, so um, in terms of um, when to set the time for these short term objectives, some things to bear in mind are. You know, the first one here is December 31st. Um, you know, obviously that's during the holiday. So is that a realistic short-term objective deadline or is the real deadline January 3rd, you know, when everyone's back in school or is it before the winter break? So, you know, that's something I would, you know, kind of look at and say, well, it says December 31st, then I guess before the break, you know, we're expecting Ray to learn 20 new objects. Does it make sense um, if this I the annual date of the IEP um, is in June? Then yeah, that may make sense. If the annual date of the IEP is November, you know, um, it depends on on you know kind of where he's starting. Um, the this um, goal says um, the present educational levels, he can only name a few objects. So that's an area where I would ask um, the IEP team to be more specific. How many, where, 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 what's our starting point? A few objects, are we talking about three? You know, is it realistic for him to go from three to 20 um, in, in this time frame? So, you know, those are the kinds of questions you wanna ask and, and the type of information you wanna look at. Okay, um, I have some goals here for inclusion um, of children in the general education curriculum. Oops, sorry, here we go. <laughs> um, the um, goals for inclusion in the general education curriculum, um, you could see here that um, one goal for this student, Joey, is um, to improve his classroom skills. And it identifies, you know, academic class periods in the general education setting. So if you're looking for goals to be implemented in the general education setting um, for, you know, inclusion goals, um, I would recommend you put that within the goal because, and you use the words general education setting with typical peers. Um, because you want to make sure that the location in which the, the goal is being implemented and where the progress is being monitored is precisely where, um, you know, the inclusion is intended. So um, just to, you know, remove any source of, you know, confusion or misinterpretation, I do recommend you put that in there. Um, and this goal, you know, um, they want Joey to achieve raising his hand waiting to be called on, um, you know, and responding or commenting 90% of the time. Um, so, um, you know, with the math computation goal, um, you know, same thing, uh, second grade um, text, sorry. Okay. That's actually a reading comprehension goal, but um, they want him to retell the story, main idea with one verbal prompt from the teacher, eight to 10 opportunities. Again, we see that it's identified in the general education classroom. Okay. So what does progress monitoring look like? Um, we've, we've talked about SMART goals and the annual goals and the level of specificity. Um, that should appear there. Um, during the course of the year, the, um, the teacher, the reading specialist, the you know, math specialist is gonna work with your child and gather information and then report on their progress throughout the year. And that's specifically what progress monitoring is. 
Is the student making progress at an expected rate? Um, are they meeting their short-term and long-term IEP goals? And does the instruction need to be adjusted or changed? And that's a nice thing about having progress monitoring throughout the course of the year, because you can get information to see whether the child is actually on track towards achieving their annual goal or whether um, either the, the type of intervention that's being used may not be working, or you know, does, the, um, do, does anything need to be adjusted or changed in order to help this child achieve the goal that was set? So in terms of progress monitoring, we're looking at this portion of the IEP, how the student's progress towards meeting the goal will be measured, when, and of course, the report on progress. Um, the when question is really the frequency. That's where we're looking at at minimum, um, at least when the students are receiving their report cards. Like I said before, it could be more frequent depending on the skill. Um, and then effective progress monitoring has different components. And um, these are all the components that you kind of go into um, appropriate effective progress monitoring. Um, it measures the behavior or the skill outlined in the goal. Um, you'd be surprised how many times that actually the report in progress has nothing to do with the annual goal or the child's needs um, that are identified in the evaluation. It uses an equivalent measure every time. What that means is that you're, you're, you're assessing the skill every time. And even if um, the um, assessment that's being used may not be exactly the same every time, it has to be at least be equivalent in, in terms of objectivity, quality, and, and the fact that it's actually measuring the scale that you're working on. Um, effective progress monitoring will provide regular and frequent data collection. The um, teacher keeps that information. Um, you have a right to ask to see it and you have a right to get a copy of it before meetings so that you can be informed and you can look at the progress and what's being worked on with your child and, and measured. Um, and it also allows the analysis of performance over time. So that's, you know, it, it means that it's quantifiable. I mean, we're looking at, you know, numbers and what your child's rate of progress is, how, you know, how much were they able to achieve the skill or the goal. The progress monitoring, um, it ensures that the report of progress, you know, matches the goal, that each aspect of the goal is being reported on. Make sure the separate skills are not mixed together so that you're getting um, like a, an accumulation or, or an average of a lot of different skills as your report of progress. Um, Make sure that the system of their progress measurement doesn't mask a continuing need. And the best example I have for that is my reading comprehension example. If your child is delayed in reading comprehension, it could be because of um, they have difficulty with explicit questions or the inferential questions, which tend to be the area where most of my clients, you know, when they have a need with reading comprehension, that's where um, we see the continuing need that's um, a skill that requires them to think abstractly, make predictions, infer things that are not written exactly within the text. So if the system that the um, school is using to measure your child's progress in reading comprehension asks a lot of explicit questions, if 90% of the tests that they're using to monitor your child's progress has 90% explicit questions, then they're not really measuring your child's need and, and they're masking you know, what could be a continuing need. 90% of those questions are explicit questions and your child is really great with those, then you know, you're really not testing the area of need and, and the area of need, even if you get all of those questions wrong, will only be 10% of their overall score. So, you know, so ask questions, ask, you know, what is being assessed? You have a right to look at the progress monitoring data and get copies of it before the meeting. 
um, see whether the student is receiving assistance in completing the skill. So um, for reading comprehension, is someone reading the passage to your child? Um, because that's not a reading comprehension skill that they're assessing. It would be a listening comprehension skill that they're assessing. So, and some kids that have reading disabilities, like they do wonderfully when you read to them. They, they can analyze, they know exactly what the story is about. They can make predictions and, and you know, infer information. Um, but when you're, if you're trying to test their ability to read or comprehend what they're reading independently, you don't want someone reading it to them. Um, as I said before, look out for group work. Um, if, you know, if your child's report on progress, if they're saying they're doing wonderfully on, you know, this particular area, um, we see a lot of that in, a, in the regular education environment where, you know, everyone works in groups, which is a wonderful thing. You know, it's, it's really wonderful. But if your child's um, performance in that class is being um, based on group work, that's something that you want to know and you want to know how much your child contributed to that group score and, you know, have a look at what your child's um, individual work performance was. Um, because again, group work is wonderful. It, it's collaborative. Um, there are a lot of benefits from it. But if you're trying to measure your child's progress, especially in an area of weakness, you want more information about that. Um, and you, you need the objective measures. As I said before, it's not, um, you know, uh, you want to stay away from the types of assessment measures that allow the teacher to use their own judgment as to whether or not you've you've achieved the goal. Okay, so um, these are some common difficulties I see, like things that um, might um, mask um, your child's continuing need, or um, it, where it may make it look like your child is making more progress than they actually are. Um, and I'm not saying again, that any of this is, is, is a bad thing. I'm just saying when, if the report of progress is based on any of this, you want to know. Um, so for instance, if when your child is being assessed, um, there are multiple choices, it's a multiple choice question so that they're, they're looking at the answer. Um, that's something you're going to want to know. Um, so, you know, um, if you're trying to test a skill where the child is um, understanding something that they're reading um, and be able to recall the information, um, you, you know, you don't want to see a multiple choice format as the measure as to whether or not they're able to independently recall information, because then, you know, in a multiple choice, they're looking at it. Um, if they're receiving multiple choice, find out how many options they have to choose from. Um, you know, I, I've had some cases where the multiple choice options were, there were just two options. Um, so the student had a 50% chance of guessing correctly um, every time. And, you know, and it looks like they're making progress when in fact, maybe, maybe it was, you know, they just got lucky. Um, if they get various opportunities to get it right, um, there are some computer programs that um, give your child a lot of opportunities to get it right. And, and, you know, and that's a wonderful learning tool. So, you know, if your child is trying to learn a skill um, and, it, you know, the computer just keeps giving them, you know, that same skill over and over, you know, try it again, try it again, try it again. Let's see if you can get it right. I think that's a wonderful learning tool because the child is repeatedly practicing the same skill until they get it correct. Um, you don't wanna see that as a progress reporting measure because the point of progress reporting is to have your child independently demonstrate that skill at a very high percentage of accuracy the first time, you know? So, um, you know, so just ask those kind of questions. Um, you know, if, if you're seeing that, you know, um, if it's a computerized, um, type assessment, you know, or, or do they have more than one chance to get the, the question right? Um, sometimes the um, programming is not testing a skill that's deficient, but also other skills that may mask the continuing need, um, which I've talked about before. Um, sometimes in uh, reading fluency measures, the child is actually reading to a computer rather than a teacher or, you know, um, and, um, 
again, you know, I would ask questions about that and, you know, whether the child can be tested with, with the teacher listening to how the child is reading. Um, there's a lot that can be missed by um, technology. I, I do think technology is amazing. Um, it enabled me to put together this PowerPoint. Um, but sometimes you really want to just get back to the basics when the student is reading. Do they sound hesitant? I mean, there's, there's a lot of qualitative information that's lost by using a computer. Does a child sound hesitant? Did they take a long time and read it very slowly? Um, you know, those are qualitative um, information that's lost when you're relying on a computer to do the progress monitoring. Um, some students start to fidget a lot because it just gets hard. Um, and, you know, a computer wouldn't be able to make those notations um, when they're reporting progress, um, but a teacher would. You know, they would see, you know, um, the child starting to move around more or look like they're nervous or just even put their head down and take a minute or two before they answer the next question. Um, those are the kind of things you want you want to know. Okay. Um, and these are just more, um, you know, specific um, um, explanations as to why, um, you know, there, there are some things that you wanna know about if your child is you know, receiving um, computerized assessments, measures to measure their progress. Okay, and um, so this is um, a computerized assessment measure that um, you know, I'm familiar with um, through one of the cases um, that I um, have litigated. And um, these are my concerns regarding the um, STAR measure assessments. And um, I just wanna, kind of, you know, point it out um, just so that, you know, some of these, um, these computerized measures have a place. Um, and, you know, in our classrooms, it's, you know, we're in the 21st century, you know, everything is technology based. And I think, I do think they're wonderful tools. Um, I just um, have a lot, you know, I encourage parents to ask a lot of questions when they're being used to measure um, progress, identify needs, and um, set annual goals. The annual goals, um, this program um, in this particular matter was used to set the annual goals for the student. Um, and, um, and that's an area that I was, you know, significantly concerned about. So, okay. So let's kind of break this down. Um, we have this um, computer generated um, assessment of progress. Um, the students started at, um, they, oh, the student when they were measured um, by cur curriculum based measure, paper, pencil, um, at, were at a 2.5 grade level. Um, the computer program also did an assessment and indicated that the student was at a 4.3 grade level with a score of 620. Um, in math. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's some discrepancy there. Um, if you see anything like that, just, you know, be aware of it and ask the teacher some questions so that you understand what this information means and what's being assessed. Um, okay, um, the STAR measures also, um, this particular student was in seventh grade. So the um, program was set to a seventh grade level because that's the curriculum. Um, that was being used for seventh grade. So the um, information being presented to this particular student for their annual goal, where they were at a 2.5 grade level, was uh, material that would normal, normally be presented to a typically developing student in the seventh grade in the area of math. So, you know, there were some disparities there um, in terms of whether the student's needs were, were being addressed. Um, okay, so some things um, to pick out here as um, areas of concern that I had seen um, regarding these measures. Um, okay, these are some of the points that I had discussed previously. All right, we're going to get to that in a second um, um, regarding the slides, um, but I do have something really cool later on. Um, okay, so uh, the reporting on progress. Um, these measures can be put on a graph. And I know, you know, this is um, a wonderful tool. Um, it's something I really like when I see and I when I see it in IEPs because it shows you 
the data that has been gathered, it shows you how the student scored on every time that the data was get gathered and it puts it on the on a graph so that you can see whether the student is kind of trending towards achieving that annual goal or, or not. So we have two um, results here. On the left, um, we have the trend line is the student's actual performance. The dotted line is the goal line. That's kind of what, you know, what the IEP team had set off to accomplish for the IEP year, the annual year. And what we see here on the graph on the left is that the student's trend line is already above what the goal line was. Um, this student is kicking it up. Um, they are exceeding their goal. And it's, you know, um, we're at about the seventh week of instruction since this annual IEP took effect. And we can see that the student is already doing great. Um, so, you know, what does that tell us? Um, it tells us that the goal is too low. It was set too low. This is an opportunity for the IEP team meeting to meet again, readjust this goal so that, you know, um, for the remaining weeks of instruction, you're, you're setting a higher goal. You're kind of re redefining it, you know, fixing, um, you know, that expectation. And, and then you're going to continue to monitor that student. But um, if, if your child is already exceeding the annual goal, there's no reason for your child to wait, you know, continue to work on that goal for an entire year that they have already mastered. You can rework the goal um, and set, you know, some different um, expectations. Um, the graph on the right has some flat scores. So, you know, you see that the little dots are the, the data that's being gathered. And you see this student's trend line is, is kind of flat, you know, even though the individual scores, you know, some are higher, some are, you know, kind of lower, but on this graph, the trend line in and of itself is, is, is flat. And you can see the goal line goes up, you know, and that's, that's the, the, and that's the expectation, you know, where the student would go. Um, in this situation, the student is not meeting the goal, um, you know, and, um, and this is also an opportunity to talk to the teacher, find out what's happening, you know, what is going on in terms of what's affecting this child and their ability to, to meet the goal. It could be a variety of different things. Um, you know, the, there could have been a death in the family and the student's not very attentive um, during instruction. Um, it could be that um, the, you know, program they're using to instruct the student is, you know, is not at the right level um, or matching up to the student's needs. So, you know, that needs to be readjusted. Um, are they receiving the instruction as a push-in service and therefore the student isn't really gaining, you know, all the benefit that they could from the instruction? Should, should it be moved to a pull-out situation? So there are a lot of different considerations that might result in this child having kind of a flatter trend line, but it is an opportunity, again, go and talk to the teacher. Um, you would get this information at minimum by the first report card. Um, you should get that progress monitoring record along with that. So you have an opportunity to, um, to tweak the goal and you know talk about what might be affecting the student. Um, the, um, you know, the method of communicating with the teacher um, really could take many you know, different forms could be weekly phone calls, communication books, data logs, um, progress reports, you know, report cards. Um, it's just, you know, the, the, the purpose is to keep all these lines of communication open um, so that as the year is progressing, um, you and the teachers can really, like, you know, be a team, you know, and, and look at the child's progress. Okay, so um, this is the, um, this is what I, wanted to get to before. This is the graph um, that I wanted to talk about. So um, in this, um, this is progress reporting for a student. And uh, I wanted to go through the process with you of looking at the annual goal, which is up top, and then looking at the progress reporting, which is on the left-hand side here of this slide. So this student um, is supposed to um, be provided a monthly research-based assessment, um, increase scores by at least 100 points 
um, in these various ar areas, algebraic concepts, geometry, probability, and the over overall basic math skills. Um, okay, that's the annual goal. We've seen it before during the presentation. Just below it on the left, we have the report on progress. And we see um, there's a table. We have um, you know, the application percents, sales tax. It looks like different um, things, you know, areas that, where the student was assessed in different skills, simple interest. Um, and then we see the um, results on the student's assignments. Um, they seem to be doing really well, except for the sales tax. And then we see the quiz scores and um, a formative assessment average is 70%. Um, and that's, you know, that's sometimes what the parents receive as your report on progress. And what does it mean? You know, um, this, you know, I would say is, is, you know, not a good example of an appropriate progress monitoring report. It has various concerns um, around it um, that we will see. Okay, first of all, the goal has the student working on algebraic concepts, geometry, probability, and overall basic math skills. The report on progress talks about multiplication. So, you know, we see here that we don't have a matchup between the annual goal and what's being reported as the child's progress. So that's an area that you wanna keep an eye on when you're receiving progress monitoring, make sure what's being reported as progress monitoring matches up with the goal. Okay, some other areas of concern here is um, the um, average here is 70%, is reported as a percentage, whereas the annual goal has us looking for an improvement of at least 100 points or more. So that also doesn't match up. The 100 points of more, you know, what is 70%? Like how many points is that? Um, so, you know, that's another area where you want to see, well, you know, the reporting on the progress isn't matching the goal. It's difficult to, you know, see whether this child is making progress because the reporting isn't lining up. Um, there are other areas besides those um, areas where I, you know, um, noted some areas of concern where that I wanted to point out. So as parents, you can ask questions, ask for information, try to get the, um, the data and the um, actual assignments that and, and the quizzes that your child is, is, you know, being given. But on these assignments, the student does very well, except for the 40%, but 82%, 87% and you know, in the 90s, but on the quizzes, they're um, getting 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70% uh, on application of percents. Why, why is there a disparity? And um, this might be a situation where the assignment um, could include um, giving the student a lot of opportunities to get it right, um, it might involve group work. So, you know, um, you know, their score is being averaged and just kind of included with other students' work. Um, the quiz scores look like they're more independent work, you know, given the disparity. Um, and but I'm just I'm just speculating. Um, as a parent, what you want to do is find out precisely what is happening and why there is this discrepancy, what's causing it. Um, because um, however the child is doing on the assignment isn't translating into this independent uh, performance of mastery. And, and you want to address that during the year. So you, you know, make sure that when they're practicing, when they're doing the assignments and they're practicing the skill that they're actually um, addressing their, their area of need. Okay, so, um, so you know, that was a drastic decrease in the quiz, quiz scores these skills are not being mastered, um, you know, so you want to look into that. The other thing is uh, at the bottom, the 70% is an average of all the 10 scores above. And that's um, something that I had spoken about before, you know, keep an eye out for, you know, when things are being grouped together. Um, you know, the 70%, um, um, you know, that doesn't look bad. It's, you know, if you're looking for 80 or 85%, you know, in terms of mastery level, that looks like you're making progress. Um, but the 70% is an average of the assignments and the quiz. If the quiz is more of an independent 
um, demonstration of the skill, then we can see that the student really in some areas are there at 40% or 50%, not really at 70%. The other thing I noted about this um, report on progress is that the 70%, this average is actually not 70%, the 68%, um, you know, so I guess it was rounded up, but, um, you know, just look at, look at this and the report of progress. If things don't seem to be lining up, you know, go in and ask questions, um, especially if the report on progress doesn't match the goal. Um, the final thing that, well, not the final thing, but the next thing um, to point out too is, um, and a lot of a lot of parents, just everyone forgets about this um, during the course of the year because you're focused on the annual goals and the progress. Um, the, um, oh, the monthly research-based assessment is not frequent enough to be able to gather a good amount of data to be able to determine whether the child is, is you know, meeting the um, mastery levels of achievement. Um, and then, the final thing is that if we go back to that evaluation or the present educational levels or the identification of the child's needs. These are the child's needs, two and three digit multiplication, math, facts, fluency, and math applications. Um, the needs are not matching up with the goal and the progress monitoring is not matching up with the goal or the goal doesn't match a progress monitoring. So, so there's a level of disconnect here in the student's program, um, you know, and these are kind of the different pieces you want to start looking at and putting together as you work along with the team to try to determine whether your child is addressing the areas of need, you know, the areas like where, where they're struggling and where they need to bring up their skills and making sure that when the report on progress, the progress is being reported is based on the areas of need that were identified. Okay, um, I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, get the data, look at the data. Um, I do want to emphasize that parents do have a right to access records. It is provided by IDEA. They grant the parents the right to examine records. Um, and the IDEA is pretty strong about, you know, this, this right. Parents must be afforded the opportunity to inspect and review educational records. Um, you know, the um, LEA, you know, the school must permit parents to inspect, inspect and review records relating to their children. Um, and sorry, um, without unnecessary delay and before any meeting regarding the IEP. So, you know, if you know you have an IEP meeting coming up, make sure you get a written request out, send an email to the teacher let them know, you, you know, you, you want to see the records, you want to see the data on which are reporting um, and, you know, take a look at it. And if you have questions, please do not hesitate to ask. The IDEA is very, very strong on, you know, needing a parent to understand the process and understand their child's education and records. Um, and your access rights include explanations and interpretations of the records, your right to request a copy, and the right to have a representative um, inspect and review the records as well. Okay, in summary, don't be afraid to ask question. It's your right as a parent to understand your child's program, and it's the school's duty to explain it to you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, for um, joining me. This is, um, this is good progress reporting. It is the last slide, I believe. Um, but you could see that the, the goal matches with the needs and the progress monitoring matches the goals, which is precisely what you want in terms of progress monitoring. Great, thank you so yeah. much, Tanya. We really appreciate you um, going through this presentation. It was phenomenal. There are so many key points um, that you you really uh, hit the nail on the head, of course. Um, but thank you again for coming out tonight. You're welcome.